değerli izleyiciler hepinize hoş geldiniz diyorum fakat e, bir dakika daha e, izninizi rica edeceğim. E, bir dakika daha beklerim çünkü halen gelenler var. Evet bir, iki dakika e, bekledikten sonra tekrar giriş yapacağım. Sanıyorum e, bu kadar beklememiz e, yeterli olacak. E, değerli izleyiciler, e, öncelikle hepinize hoş geldiniz diyorum. E, bugün 14 Mart e, ve e, yine bir pazar e, günü. E, ve Türkiye'de pazar günleri sokağa çıkma kısıtlaması e, devam ediyor. E, bu arada bugün tıp bayramı olması nedeniyle e, bizi izleyenler arasında... Sağlık çalışanları varsa e, onlara da e, selamlarımızı e, iletiyoruz. E, şimdi artık simultane çeviri olacağı için e, o kanalı da açabiliriz. Bizler, önce ben de müsaadenizle kontrol edeyim e, kendi kanalımı bir problem var mı? Çünkü sizlere de e, bu konuda bir açıklama yapacağım. Evet, ben e, şu an e, Türkçe kanalındayım ve e, beni e, Türkçe olarak e, e, dinliyorsunuz. E, Akmet ekibi olarak etkinliğimize e, hazırız. Her zaman olduğu gibi moderatör rolünü e, ben üstlendim, Oğuz Tekin olarak. Emrullah Bey çevrim içi mekanizmayı kontrol altında tutuyor ve çevirmenimiz de Karel Hanım. Kendisi e, Stephen Mitchell'ın e, konuşmasının aynı zamanda Türkçe olarak sizlere ulaşmasını sağlayacak. Aynı zamanda diyorum çünkü önünüzdeki Zoom ekranında dil seçeneğini İngilizce olarak tutmanız gerekiyor. Evet şu an tekrar e, ben bunu tekrar etmek istiyorum. Yeni açanlar için de bu konferans simultane çeviri olarak yapıldığı için lütfen Zoom ekranının altında bulunan interpretation yazısının olduğu yerden dilinizi seçiniz. Eğer Türkçe dinlemek istiyorsanız Türkçeyi seçiniz. İngilizce dinlemek istiyorsanız İngilizce seçiniz. Sanıyorum bu anlaşıldı. Emrullah Bey chatten de Aynı şekilde e, bu durumu e, size yazacaktır. Çeti de kontrol etmenizi e, rica ediyorum. Şimdi e, tabii e, bugün e, aslında tam manasıyla uluslararası bir konferans etkinliği e, yapacağız. E, konuşmacımız Steven Mitchell Berlin'den katılıyor. Simultane çevirmenimiz Karel Hanım, yanlışım varsa düzeldin lütfen, Zürich'ten e, katılıyor. Bizler de Akmet ekibi olarak Antalya'dayız. Artık sizlerin nerede olduğunu e, hiç e, sormuyorum. Çünkü internetten yapılan etkinliklerde gerçekten şehir ya da ülke önemli olmuyor. Malum internetteysek her yerdeyiz. Efendim lafı... Uzatmayayım. Bugünkü konuğumuz Profesör Stephen Mitchell. Kendisi uzun yıllar e, İngiltere'de Exeter Üniversitesi'nde çalıştı ve şu anda emekli ve Berlin'de yaşıyor. Bugünkü konu başlığı Güney Anadolu'da seyahat ve yaylacılık. Aslında vakti zamanında Antalya ve civarında yapmış olduğu arkeolojik çalışmaları ve 
sonuçlarından bize bahsedecek. Antalya'yı bilenler için döşeme boğazı e, yabancı olmasa gerek e, bu bölgeyi e, kendisinden dinleyeceğiz. Değerli izleyiciler, e, sorularınız olursa lütfen çete yazınız. Sunum bittikten sonra vaktin el verdiği ölçüde soru cevap kısmına geçeceğiz. Profesör Steven Hello. Good afternoon everybody. First of all, please show that you can hear me clearly. I think I think I'm I'm clearly audible. I'm um, thank you very much for inviting me to give this lecture this afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and especially that the invitation has come from Professor Oz Tekin, with whom I've been working for the last six months as I've been preparing a book on the subject which I'm going to talk about today, which will, I hope, be published by Ahmed in the not too distant future. So for me, this is a wonderful opportunity to present uh, some of what I think are the highlights or the main conclusions of uh, a study. Um, I'm speaking to you from Berlin, uh, where I've lived for the last five years after I'd retired from my academic job, which was a professor in the United Kingdom at the University of Exeter. Um, but as many of you know, most of my academic life has been concerned directly or indirectly with the history of Asia Minor, of Turkey. I've been a frequent visitor since my, the beginning of my doctoral studies in 1970, which is a very long time ago now. Um, and I've never considered leaving this particular field of study, which has always, I've always found compelling and fascinating there have always been new things to say, new things to hear, um, and uh, it's been a, a constant story of exploration and discovery, not just on the ground, but also intellectually, and uh, I'm still at it. Um, uh, Ozbe, I don't know if you wanted to ask me one or two more questions, or should I step straight into my lecture? Yeah, yeah. I can go straight to my yeah, lecture yeah. then. In, in fact, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, oh, we sent also our greetings uh, to you from Turkey and Antalya. Um, thank you very much for, as I say, once again for inviting me. Right, I'm now going to go straight to share my screen with you, which will start the the slideshow. Right, I, I hope everybody is, is, is seeing that. Um, an introductory view of the landscape where I worked in two seasons of survey in 1993, 1996, but which I have visited many, many times since then, um, as it's a uh, one of the most wonderful places in the Antalya region, I think not only for me, but for an increasing number of other visitors. Um, I've given my lecture the title Travel and Transhumance in Anatolia, Lessons from Landscape Archaeology. Um, and it's been inspired by a quotation from a wonderful book about the region written by the French geographer Xavier de Planhol, published in 1958, uh, about the Pamphylia Pisidia region from the point of view of a modern geographer. And he wrote the quotation which I've translated on the screen there. The most notable feature of life in the mountains bordering the Anatolian plateau is unquestionably the habit of perpetual movement which shapes the lives of animals and people from one end of the year to another. 
So what I'm going to be talking about is a very well-known Roman road, the so-called Via Sebaste. Um, the archaeological sites which we examined in the Dershima Boaza, especially the lower site, north of Antalya, and then put them in their geographical setting and try to understand their wider significance. The geography of Western Turkey provides a broad context for understanding. The map on the right-hand side of this slide shows the first Roman roads uh, built between 129 and 126 before Christ in West and Southwest Asia Minor. As you see, Istanbul and Ankara are not in the picture at all. The main route of communication crossed Anatolia from the Gallipoli Peninsula uh, all the way down to the southwest, to, to the southeast, to, to Side. Um, in the northwest, at the European end, the route connected with the Roman road that crossed the northern Aegean, the so-called Via Egnatia, ran westwards across northern Greece uh, to the uh, coast of the Adriatic, and you could take a boat from there, you could get to Brindisi in Italy, uh, and then the, your final destination was Rome. So despite the size of the Roman Empire, there was in fact a very direct line of communication all the way to southern Turkey, to southern Asia Minor. Um, however, we're going to be concerned in this talk, this road obviously took us, took, went through the major cities of Western uh, Roman Asia Minor, Pergamon, Sardis, Smyrna, Ephesus on the coast. But the, the bit that we're going to be looking at in more detail uh, covers the stretch from Laodicea, Denizli to Perge. And the Dershima Boaz lies uh, at the, obviously the southwest, southeast end of that, that, that stretch. And the more detailed map in, on the left hand of this slide shows you uh, the Dershima Boaz itself in some detail. Um, the road from Perge coming up from the plain, entering a narrow defile, a pass, uh, crossing a little plain, re-entering another defile, and emerging into the highland territory of Pisidia. And there are two ancient sites along this stretch of the road, what we call the Upper Dershemeso site and the Lower Dershemeso site. If I had time, I would talk about the Upper Dershime uh, site, but time is limited. And so most of my focus is going to be on remains at the lower site. This map shows in more detail the section between Laodicea and Perge, and indeed Side. And the, this stretch of the map from Laodicea to the south end of the Bordeaux Lake uh, was part of the Asian road. But from that point onwards down to Perge, it overlaps with um, uh, the famous Roman Via Sebaste, the road built by the Emperor Augustus, um, which shares the same course as the Asian road for that stretch. But at that point, south of the Bordeaux Lake, it takes a, a curve to the north and northeast, heading for its main destination in the interior of Turkey, which was uh, Antioch by Pisidia, modern Yalbach, before it continued further east, uh, eventually to Konya, Iconium. Milestones and other features are marked on this map, which will appear in the publication. Um, one important difference between the later Via Sebaste, built by Augustus, 
dated 65 BC, according to milestones, and the earlier road from 129 BC is that the Via Sebaste was probably paved with stone paving, uh, whereas the Asian road, for the most part, I think was simply an earth road, an unpaved road. But one point that I'll emphasize now, and I will re-emphasize later, is that the Asian road and the Via Sebaste were both inter-provincial highways. They don't serve local traffic. They have very distant destinations in view, uh, crossing long distances. This building that you see in front of you on the, this slide um, was the structure which attracted the attention of David French, one of my most important mentors, who for 25 years explored the Roman roads in Turkey. It stands exactly beside the trace of the Via Sebaste. And when he saw it for the first time in 1990, or I think 1990, he recognized at once that this was almost certainly uh, a Roman way station a so-called manzio in Latin, a place where people stayed uh, overnight on the road. Not so much a, a caravanserai or an inn where travelers of any sort could stop, but a, uh, an official building designed for soldiers, government officers, travelers with official permits, um, so um, a state uh, resting house beside the road. This structure, as far as we know, is unique in Turkey. Um, I know of none that is strictly comparable to it in design, location, or function. And indeed, um, I, after doing what research I can on this, have only found one other building in the entire Roman Empire which I think is closely comparable to it. And that hasn't been excavated and is only known through aerial survey uh, and remote sensing operation in South Germany. So this is a really very, very special building um, indeed. And it's remarkably well preserved. So I'll come and speak about that uh, in a, again in a few minutes time. Well, we can't talk about Roman roads without having some idea of what the remains of Roman roads look like. Um, a road is a road at the end of the day. It's not um, a terrifically exciting um, uh, ancient monument in itself, but of course it always evokes thoughts, uh, imagination of who traveled on it, where they traveled to, uh, how it served the communities of the past. So here are a few um, uh, four views of uh, the Roman road in the, in, in, in the vicinity of the Dershima Boaz. Uh, top left is a stretch uh, up to the northwest of the Dershima Boaz. Top right and bottom left are stretches preserved within the pass. And the bottom right, the rather ugly picture of stones is designed to show that this road was in use for hundreds of years, indeed thousands of years, has been many times rebuilt and repaved. You can see three levels on that one picture alone. It was constantly repaired and rebuilt and maintained in late Roman, Byzantine, Seljuk and Ottoman times until about 19, uh, until about up to about 1890, um, when the main road over the higher Chubuk Baza was built um, a little to the west. So you can call this road a, a Roman road, you could call it a Byzantine road, you can call it an Ottoman road, and all those answers are correct.
Um, Romans put milestones along their road. It's worth remembering that they are the only one of those cultures that put milestones along their road. Milestones are a very particular Roman form of monument. Um, they have some practical use in that they indicate the distance in miles from between the milestone and the destination which the traveler was going to. Um, but I think more important than that is that they are a mark of authority set up by Roman governors and Roman emperors, the people who ruled the land. So they make a very clear statement, even if you couldn't read the language of the milestone, they are in Latin and Greek, um, uh, that the Romans were the people who had built the road, who controlled the road, and by that they controlled uh, the country or the province. And the three examples you can see here are respectively one from the earliest road building phase, the Republican period, 129, 126 BC. A milestone of the Via Sebaste itself, in fact, precisely in the Dershime Pass of 6 to 5 BC by the Emperor Augustus, and a, uh, a stray milestone, one of very few others in this region, uh, put up by the uh, Roman emperors at the beginning of the third century, Septimius Severus and Caracalla, um, uh, when, of course, the road was still very much in use. Now, there is another monument or building which is closely associated with both the Via Sebaste and other roads in this region, and which has a rather different sort of story to tell us. And this category of monument um, are the cisterns. Cisterns for containing water, holding water, large quantities of water, um, uh, very many of them placed precisely along the lines of the roads which were in constant use, Roman, Byzantine and Ottoman times. Um, one of the values of these systems is precisely topographical, that in stretches of countryside where the Roman road itself is destroyed or covered up by an accumulation of soil, um, you can't say exactly where the road ran, but the cisterns provide you with um, a highly reliable guide to exactly the course of, of, of, of the road, especially uh, in those sections where it passed through plains uh, where an accumulation of soil has covered the ancient traces. Um, the work that I did in 1995-1996 on the Dershima bars has been immeasurably enhanced by the survey of the systems in this whole region, which has been done over many, many years of amateur but highly skilled uh, um, under undertaking by my, my American friend Bob Wagner. Um, who I believe may even be listening at some ungodly hour to this lecture in the uh, west coast of the United States. Um, and he has documented uh, the systems and that documentation, as you will see in this lecture, provides an invaluable underpinning to understanding both travel within the region and other vital aspects of the local economy and society. This uh, slide um, uh, is designed to illustrate the point that I've just made, um, namely that uh, the systems 
um, show the course of the road in stretches where no trace of the road actually survives above ground to be seen today. So coming from the bottom left of the, of, of, of the map, we have the, um, um, the Dershimo bars itself. I've got the pointer roughly in that position. Um, well preserved in the D file. But once it reaches the plain, uh, a flat area, there's too much soil overburden, you can't see the road, but you can see an unmistakable line of systems which take the, show us the course of the road across the plain and then into another hilly section where traces of the road itself are fully preserved through a little dog leg, back into a plain where we're lucky enough to have both forms of of, of evidence, the, the, the systems and the road surface, up to the little now Beledia of Kuzulkaya, um, and then westwards to the ancient Roman colony of Komama, with a system in the plain to, to, to indicate where the road ran. Um, so a vital, uh, as it were, topographical tool um, for following uh, for following roads. The last point I want to make about the roads themselves um, is to repeat what I said a bit earlier, that these roads were built with long distance destinations in view. The Via Sebaste ran from Perge to Antioch, Yalvach, uh, and then further east to um, Konya, Iconium. Uh, the Asian road, as you saw at the beginning, is an even longer stretch in conception from Side to the Dardanelles. The milestone found near Side by David French back in 1990 carries a measurement, I think, of 334 miles on it, which is the distance from sea day to Pergamon, um, astounding. The milestone in the Dershe Meboise records 139 miles from the Dershe Meboise to Antioch. This information was of no use at all to a local traveler. Um, and more than that, I believe that the Via Sebaste itself would have been very little use to most of the inhabitants of Pamphylia and Pisidia. It basically was a way out of the region, not a way to get around in the region. The network of roads that joined the local cities with one another was an entirely different one. And even the most important cities of the highlands, Temesos, Sagalassos, Kremna, Selge were completely off the Via Sebaste. It had nothing to do with them. Um, so the entire design is completely different from the road system of the neighboring province of Lycia, which is now um, extremely well known thanks to the wonderful Stadi Osmos inscription uh, published now, well, gradually published over the years, but over 20, 25 years ago, and still rightly um, the object of intensive uh, research. Um, but what it shows is a dense network of roads built in Lycia in, as a result of close cooperation between the local authorities, the local cities, uh, and the, the new Roman masters of the province um, to create a, a, a network for a whole province. Uh, in the region that we're looking at, there is nothing remotely like it. The Via Sebaste uh, in no way serves the same purpose or represents the same concept of a road system uh, as the uh, Stadiasmos uh, reveals about ancient. Lycia. Let's return now to um, the, the Mancio. This official Roman building, probably built 
in the fourth century AD um, uh, was roughly rectangular in layout. Um, it had about nine rooms in the lower story on the ground floor where animals were stabled and a range of six first floor rooms for living accommodation for either people who were resident there all the time or for the passing traffic of soldiers and officials. I calculate on the basis of comparisons with other evidence, looking at the rooms, their size, their layout, that it might have held two to four soldiers, just a small group of military personnel, maybe six stable lads, uh, men who would have looked after the, the horses and the mules that were stabled there and made available for travelers. There must have been a domestic staff of women who did the cooking and the cleaning and uh, looked after the other needs of the household, perhaps two or three. And then there would have been the travelers who came through, the, the couriers, the officers, the soldiers and officials who stopped to change horses or stopped to uh, stay overnight. It looks as if this um, Mansio would have been the first stopping point on the road out of Perge. It's about 28, 30 kilometers to Perge by direct line. So a sort of a fairly easy day's journey for uh, a traveling group. Um, and yeah, you've just got the, the, the general view from the southwest and then a view uh, from the southeast showing the uh, uh, very well preserved uh, walls at this end, um, surviving up to the second story, giving the entire contours of ground floor and, and first floor rooms. On that basis, um, I think it is possible to make a, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the Mancio. And this is a, a, a, a, an effort, uh, a, a, a first reconstruction uh, made by an absolutely splendid firm called Lithodomos, who work, have worked with the British Institute at Ankara's uh, Pisidia Heritage Project, uh, which has been uh, elaborating and laying out a trekking route around um, uh, these, this part of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of, of Turkey, north of um, Antalya, um, uh, a trekking route that links the ancient sites with one another. And thanks to the work of the Lithodomos team, you can now get uh, an app which you can download onto your phone, uh, which gives reconstructed views of how those ancient sites might have looked um, uh, and give you a, a virtual reality experience uh, when you are actually on site. So absolutely a fantastic uh, uh, um, asset for uh, any visitor to the site. And, um, I have to admit, with, with my advice, they came up with this uh, reconstruction of the Mancio, which gives, uh, which is about 60% right and 40% wrong. Um, the, the appearance of the front of the building, I think, is correct. The, uh, the left-hand side, the tower in the corner is probably right, although I think the roof sloped down to the back and not to the side. Um, the back range is correct but the very impressive right wing of the building, I think is a fantasy. Um, obviously, we, I was inclined to try and reconstruct this building symmetrically, but when we look at the aerial photograph that was taken by David French's team in 1993, which shows the Mancio from above, You can see there is the right wing. Um, David's uh, surveyor, Brian Williams, was, uh, was only able to trace very, I hope I'm, I had a brief interruption of my uh, 
transmission, but I think I'm audible now. Um, O's interrupt me and tell me if I'm not clear, but otherwise I will continue. No, it, it's okay. There's some little problem, but it's okay. Okay, fine. Um, so this, I think, is, is, is a truer representation of the, the ground floor plan. And these so-called walls in the uh, uh, southeast, southwest corner are, in fact, later and in, in, uh, insubstantial walls, probably for herding animals in and nothing to do with the original design. So the building was not quite as splendid as that reconstruction. Uh, suggests. Um, and that, in fact, fits with the fact that this was a very functional building. It wasn't a luxurious accommodation, simple rooms uh, to provide soldiers and officials. Um, it's nothing, it's not uh, uh, a grand representative um, building. This is the plan of the lower Dershime site. The, the Mancio is at the um, uh, northwest corner where the road comes in from the pass and then this is the line of the Sea of Pia Sebaste uh, leading uh, south eastwards. Um, the rest of the settlement um, could be traced and, and planned in 1993. It would be very much harder to do that today because the, there's made, it's been heavily overgrown. Um, but we're able to detect about four churches, one, two, three and four across the, the settlement, 10 or 12 farmhouses, usually uh, irregularly, irregular, arrangement of rooms around a courtyard with a cistern and some of them with towers, clearly sort of substantial two or even three story towers uh, that form a sort of centerpiece of the farmhouse. Uh, dear Stephen, I think there is uh, some uh, interruption, a problem, but uh, perhaps we can wait one minute. I don't know uh, what's happening, but we have a problem now. You, you, you can restart, you can re restart your presentation, please. Uh, screen share, yeah. It's okay, thank you. It came again. But your, your voice, your microphone, please. I've unmuted. Yeah. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Very good, very good. Thank you. Um, so four churches obviously intended for the use of the travelers as much as for the local people. But I want now to look at this big building at the lower settlement. Um, as I said, it's a very large, irregular, but rectangular structure measuring about 80 by 80 meters, enclosing six and a half thousand square meters, that's two thirds of a hectare. It had no roof. Uh, it's far too broad a span to have for a roof. And there are almost no internal features apart from a number of deep systems and some small structures 
of no particular importance. What can it possibly be? Um, the explanations suggested so far by people who've traveled and visited and commented are include a monastery, a fort, a large depot for storing agricultural produce. Uh, none of those explanations for various reasons seem to me to be very convincing. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of structural details which uh, I found sort of useful clues for thinking about the building. On this slide, you can see this pattern of, of holes in the walls. Uh, they, they do form quite a, a regular arrangement um, and they are um, completely free holes going from one side of the wall to the other. They must have held wooden beams. Uh, there must have been a wooden structure attached to this wall. I'll explain a little more when I come to the next slide. Um, when we look at those walls from the inside, one struck by the fact that there are internal buttresses quite modest ones, only 70 centimeters deep, 50 centimeters wide, but enough to give the wall a little more stability. Um, the beam holes you can see on the interior face. Um, and I think that my, the only sense I can make of these is that these beams must have been part of a timber, scaffolding structure which was fixed against the wall and designed to give it resilience and stability. One of the features of building in the villages of this whole region of southwest Turkey and Burdur, Isparta uh, and that region is a combination of um, stone and timber buildings in uh, and the reason for this is that it gives strength against earthquakes. The stone is very stable and static, and, uh, but it's, it's, it has no flexibility, whereas the timber has that certain inbuilt flexibility that, and by combining stone and timber, you, have, you, you produce a building, a structure, which is much more resistant to earthquake damage than, uh, a stone building alone. So that's my explanation for this peculiar feature of uh, the building. The other point I want to make is that these walls are very, very narrow. They're only 80 or 90 centimeters uh, thick, and they're nowhere near strong enough to have served as a defensive, for a defensive fortress. They, they would have fallen to a, um, any, a very slight uh, sort of um, effort by uh, an enemy attacking them. So can I, have I got an explanation for the walls and the structure? Well, I have. I'm not completely convinced that I'm correct, but it's the best answer that I've been able to come up with. Um, the only building that I can find in the entire Middle East which is similar to this is a structure surveyed in before the First World War in Syria, uh, a site called Stabal Antar, dated by an inscription to the late 6th century AD, AD 577, 578, um, uh, roughly the same size as the um, Dershime Bar's enclosure. Uh, also with internal buttresses on the walls, um, uh, slender walls. Um, and the name Stabal Antar is the clue to its function. It was a stable, it was an enclosure for animals. And that I think is what uh, the Dershima Bar's uh, structure is about. Um, the enclosure, enabled you to 
collect a large number of animals, uh, or hold a large number of animals at any one time, mostly sheep and goats, but of course it could also be cattle or, or horses or camels. Um, but why were the walls so high? The only answer that I've been able to come up with myself is that high walls provide shade, not at all times, not when the sun is directly overhead, uh, but most of the daylight hours, they provide large areas of, of shade and animals being moved uh, through the pass, stopping at this point, maybe for more than several days at a time, would have needed to be shaded as well as watered and fed. So this is what I think we've got here. What I'm quite sure is that this structure is connected with, um, uh, with herding animals. Um, and it seems from the ge geographical location that it was ideally placed, uniquely placed to provide prote protection and control of transhuman flocks passing through the Dershina bars uh, between their winter pastures in the Antalya region and their summer pastures in the Pisidian highlands. The enclosure stopped them from straying. There was water there from the cisterns. Fodder could be brought in. The walls cast shadows which gave protection from the hot sun. This is the view over the location from the hillside just above the Mancio. So we're looking across the lower site to that enclosure building. It gives a very clear uh, idea of its situation and the way that it was ideally placed um, to control the movement of course of people, but far more important, the movement of, of animals. It commands this fantastic panorama of the Travertine terraced countryside, uh, south of the, on the south edge of the Taurus mountains or between uh, the Taurus mountains and um, Antalya itself. And those, that area formed the winter pasturing grounds of countless, uh, uh, grazing animals from November to May every year, the winter pastures before they went up to the highlands. And every animal from Western Pamphylia that was going uh, into those Yaila uh, would pass by this building. Let me turn back now to the other indispensable surviving feature of this historic landscape, that is um, the ancient and Ottoman systems, which have been so scrupulously documented by Bob Wagner's fantastic survey. I think he's got about 125 examples, all recorded with photographs, location data, estimates of their size, and a few notes on their construction. Um, now is not the time to do a sort of in-depth analysis of the architecture, but broadly speaking, it seems that the barrel vaulted systems are Roman or late Roman in origin, whereas those with domed roofs are almost certainly Ottoman in origin, um, but both styles were kept in use for hundreds, thousands of years, uh, rebuilt many times. Um, just like the road, just like the road itself. What's crucial for us in using this information from the systems uh, comes from their, their, their locations. Um, they occur in extraordinary frequency across the terrain between Antalya and the Taurus. All those blue dots on, on that map are our systems. Um, they mark the lines of ancient routes and roads so we have the Via Sebaste itself uh, from Perge up to the Dershina bars. We have the road which ran from Antalya Atalea to Termesos, clearly marked by the systems 
uh, which run up to Kapakaya before the road curves into the mountains to the city site of uh, Tamasos itself. Uh, they mark the line of a road which ran from Tamesos or the, the gorge below Tamesos to, to Perge. Um, there's a, a clear line that runs uh, a little bit to the west of Varsak um, up here to, um, from Antalya um, and to heading eventually to the, for, for the Dershime Boas. Um, uh, and over and above the systems which can be linked more or less convincingly to an ancient road, there are others uh, placed strategically across this travertine countryside which provided water for the very, very high animal population that grazed, this, uh, grazed these areas in antiquity and Ottoman times. They, perhaps even more than that big enclosure building, are the lasting fixed testimony to the transhuman economy of Pamphylia and Pisidia, which depended, as de Planhol so eloquently put it, on the seasonal movement of animals and men between lowlands and highlands in antiquity, in Ottoman times, and in the early Turkish Republic up to 1950, when to our great good fortune, the plan hole was available to observe and record them in such uh, uh, eloquent and, and, and instructive detail. Um, so, and the systems, this record, this modern record of the systems is, is, is I think perhaps, you know, the archeologists answer to the ethnographic and geographical data that was accumulated by de Planhol in his, uh, in his mid 20th century survey. I come now to my, my last slide, um, which is an attempt to give a, a sort of a, a picture of how I understand transhumans and the ancient economy of this region to have, have worked. And here I'm imagining, I've been talking a little bit about landscape archaeology, I'm imagining raising my eyes from uh, the ruins that we see in the Dershima bars to a, a, a panorama or a, a vista which covers a vast area of southwest central Anatolia. And as you can see from the map, it's framed by four major cities. Laodicea, Denizli, more or less, uh, in the north west. Uh, Sagalassos um, in the northeast. Perge in the southeast, and Kibira in the southwest. And draw a line between those uh, four cities, between each of them, and you create uh, a, a rather satisfyingly reg uh, regular parallelogram, uh, a rhomboid shape um, covering uh, this, this, this area of, of, of southwest um, Turkey. Um, the ancient highway, the Via Sebaste in the south part, turning into the what I call the Asian Road up as far as Laodicea, um, ran directly through the middle of this uh, area in the southern section, and then tends up towards the north as it approaches Laodicea um, at the, um, in, in, in the northwestern uh, section. Um, it, it had passed this ancient road unavoidably, it had no option but to pass through the Dershima Boas, which was the first stage, as it were, in the migration route or the, the transhuman route from the plains into the mountains. Um, the largest yaila used by transhuman populations in the 19th and 20th century was at Serbuje yaila, uh, marked here. Um, on, no, marked there on the map, that's Serbije, 
Yaila, um, near the ancient colony of Olbasa, Roman colony of Olbasa, um, and pretty close to the exact center of this entire region. Um, I found that I was having a discussion, at least a, a, a virtual discussion with the Austrian researchers who produced the wonderful three volume Tabule Imperi Byzantini uh, of the sites in this region, um, Hans Gerd Hellenkemper on Friedrich Hild, um, who address in the introduction to those three volumes, this enormous gazetteer of the sites of the region, um, the question of, of transhumance. And they're very decided against the idea that there could have been transhumance in Roman times, uh, but rather that this was a phenomenon that came with the arrival of the, the Turks and in, in the Seljuks and other Turkic tribes from the 12th century onwards. Um, nobody disputes the second half of that statement that there were many, many transhuman uh, Turkic uh, groups uh, which were duly um, recorded by the plan hall at the end of that, the Ottoman period and the early Republican period. But was there really no transhumance in the Roman period? Um, Helen Kemper and Hilt's argument was that in ancient times, ancient cities controlled territories with agricultural and other features, and they would have been hostile and resistant to transhuman groups moving into through their territories, intruding on their crops and so on and so forth. That in other words, a transhuman lifestyle, a transhuman economy was incompatible with that of an economy of settled cities. And they said, and we have settled cities in the mountains as well as the plains. So transhumans is simply not a significant major feature of the economy of um, uh, and the lifestyle of these areas in, in, in Roman times. Um, but if you look at my map, you ask the question, well, where are the ancient cities that are supposed to have obstructed transhumans? And the answer is there are hardly any. There are a number of small cities in Pisidia, which I've marked, they're too small to read on the map, are hardly bigger than, than villages. Um, but for the most part, this is empty of major settlements. It's an area of uh, tribal occupation. My yellow flags mark areas where inscriptions tell us that tribal populations um, were, were living. Um, there is, contrary to the claims of the Austrian scholars, no obstacle at all to uh, a very extensive transhuman economy operating in this area from uh, lo local cities. Um, quite the contrary, they must, I think, the smallish small cities will have profited from the, uh, uh, the, the transhuman um, economy. Animal rearing and animal products, milk, cheese, a little meat, but above all textiles, wool, were the mainstay of the transhuman economy observed by the plan hole 1947 to 1950. You just have to read the book. Wool is easily obtained and easily transportable on the backs of animals. It's one of the most easily movable products of the ancient world. And I'm sure it was this wool for textile production, which was the economic driving force of the entire region in Roman and late Roman times. And the Asian road provided an artery of communication uh, and an artery of transport um, for moving this product. And it wouldn't have been the only road, but it would have been a very important one. Um, from the mountain pastures, to the two most important textile towns of Western Turkey, namely Laodicea and Hierapolis, um, uh, 
the, the equivalent of the modern Denizli, which of course, as you know, is still uh, one of Turkey's most important textile producing towns. De Planhol was able to observe those activities as an ethnographer and a geographer. And as I've said, we're very fortunate that he can interpret what he recorded in such a masterly way. Um, students of antiquity are not so fortunate in their sources. These matters are hardly recorded in ancient texts and inscriptions. But what I hope that I've shown is how by how using some of the techniques of landscape archaeology, um, this gives us a way of understanding the movement of men and animals um, and how the society and economy of this re region uh, worked in Roman and late Roman times. Uh, and that map, which is where I, I'll leave you with that, is my attempt to try and sort of re represent this conclusion to the book that we've written and, uh, uh, and, and this lecture in a, in a graphic form um, and give you something to think about and discuss. Thank you very much for listening to me. Ee, biz çok teşekkür ediyoruz e, kendisine. E, dilerseniz e, şimdi e, soru ve cevap e, kısmına geçebiliriz. E, biraz vaktimiz var. Ee, ya da mesajlarda neler var onlara bir bakmak istiyorum hemen buradan bakayım. Turhan Kaçar Turhan Kaçar e, çok selamlarını iletiyor kendisine Turhan Kaçar'ı tanıyoruz sanıyorum hocamız da Stephen, Stephen Bey ee, birçok teşekkür var e, konuşması için Evet, Mustafa Büyük Kolancı aynı şekilde. Evet, bir soru var. Burada ben isterseniz Türkçe olarak okuyayım bunu. <gülüyor> Bu yol üzerinde yani... Via Sebaste yol üzerinde herhangi bir Selçuklu ya da Beylikler dönemi mimari verileri var mı? Thank you for the thank you for the question. Um, the answer is not directly, but many of you will know that there is a very well known sequence of Seljuk caravanserais that runs north from. Uh, Antalya or the Antalya region uh, into the highlands uh, marked by Kirkas Han at the foot of the Chubuk Baza, Susas Han, uh, um, Injili Han, uh, and then eventually you've got another Han at Eridia, another one at Kuzl I think towards Konya and, and others in between. So there is a, a, a very important Seljuk route from uh, Konya, uh, first running eastwards and then south to the, the coast linking to Antalya, which um, was exactly as important in its in a different way for the Seljuks as the uh, these roads, this Asian road was for the Romans. But you can see the direction has changed that uh, Konya was the, um, the focal point of Seljuk power in the 12th and 13th centuries in South Central Anatolia. And therefore the routes uh, of, of travelers, of officials, of commerce uh, was a rather different one from that in, in the Roman times. So um, uh, the, the, the Seljuk routes are there, and, and the positioning of the Hans are, are, are telling us a similar story, but about a different culture with a different economic and social 
underpinning to it. Peki, teşekkür ederiz. Bu soruyu Meydan Palalı sormuştu. Şimdi bir bir başka e, soru e, İngilizce gelmiş belki Karel Hanım da görüyordur Bahattin Bayram'dan. E, bu yollar, bu bölgedeki yollar Hristiyanlığın yayılmasında etkili oldu mu? Yani Hristiyanlık, yani geç antik çağda bu yollar ve Hristiyanlık hakkında ne söylemek ister? Thank you very much for that question. Um, uh... The, the, the study of the spread of Christianity, the early spread of Christianity in Turkey, of course, is, is very much a, a, a, a very topical one. A lot of people are, are, are working on it and have um, theories and ideas. Um, uh, we know that St. Paul was a, a mission, led missionary journeys into Anatolia. Um, I'm quite certain that when St. Paul first traveled to Antioch, Pisidian Antioch was the first place in Turkey where he stopped for any length of time to, to, to bring the, the, the, the new mes message of Christianity. And he came from Perge. It seems to me 100% clear, I've always thought this, that he must have used the Via Sebaste because here was a, a newly built Roman highway, which was highly convenient, and it served his purpose uh, um, precisely. So, and of course, Christians, like anybody else uh, wishing to move around um, in Anatolia, uh, travel from city to city, networking from one place to another, would have used um, the, the, the best and most convenient roads that were available to them. Um, and there's absolutely no doubt that the roads that I've been showing today would have served that purpose. Now, whether you can say that Christianity spread faster and became more firmly established because the roads were there is maybe going a little bit too far. There are all sorts of reasons why Christianity was attractive to people, not just because um, it was easy for a missionary to come along a road and arrive at your city and preach or persuade or you so so that the, the the question about the spread of christianity why does it spread why does it become uh, why, why is it attractive to people is i think a lot more complicated than just saying the roads provided easy access uh, but the fact that they did provide easy access is um, is uh, uh, certainly an important factor in the in answering the question. So thank you very much for the question. Bir başka soru seçkin e, hanımdan geliyor. E, diyor ki e, Mansio yapıları Mansio yapıları. Hmm. Deniz kıyısın kentlerinde de var mıydı yoksa daha çok karasal bölgelerde iç kara iç yollarda mı bulunuyordu mansiyolar? Çok kentte var. Mıydı? Another another very good question. I think that the, the harbor towns of uh, the Roman Empire um, certainly must have had official. Um, places for, for officials to stay while they waited for boats or when they landed. Um, none of them, as far as I know, I may be wrong on this, has ever been positively identified. Um, and the point about Amancia, or the one that I showed you from the Dershima bars, is that um, uh, is that it was designed for the as much for the animals, the horses, the mules, uh, maybe donkeys as well, that were used for the uh, the travelers going through, as for um, the, the people, the personnel. Uh, and therefore, in that sense, Amancio was very much um, a feature of um, road going through sort of interior uh, regions rather than of harbor towns. Um, 
you needed to supply the needs of travelers in harbor towns as well, but the needs would have been slightly different. I'm seeing lots of questions on the chat myself, some of which relate to caravanserais. Was there an entrance fee for staying in a Han or a caravanserai? How long would people stay there? The answer is I don't think my mancio is like an inn. It's for officials who have permits to stay there. It's not, a, uh, it's not like a hotel where you have to pay the bill when you, you leave. There were certainly uh, uh, inns or caravanserais or similar um, places to accommodate private travellers, and I've no doubt they had to pay their fees, um, uh, but that's not relevant to an official mancio. Um, another panelist asked uh, another question about whether sure, there were. Sure. Hmm? Pardon. Pardon. Özellikle e, yukarı döşeme boğazındaki yerleşimle ilgili sorular geliyor. Yukarı mm -hmm. döşeme boğazı. Evet. Yukarı döşeme boğazı yerleşimi. Uh, what is the question about it? Orada orada bir yerleşim var mıydı yukarı döşeme boğazı? Bir yerleşim, bir settlement var mı? E, bunun hakkında birkaç söz söyleyebilir mi? Hı mm hı. -hmm. I can say a little bit about uh, uh, the upper site is essentially um, a village um, with both larger and smaller houses. There's a single church there, but beside the road, uh, on the left-hand side of the road, um, there's a series of buildings, all of which I think are connected to the travelers who went through. There's a, there's a bathhouse, very well preserved, with um, four bathing rooms and a corridor. Um, that would have been a, an important facility for travellers as well as local people. The bathhouse was supplied by a set of six cisterns. Um, that's the biggest group of cisterns that we find anywhere in the region that Bob Wagner has, has, has, has surveyed. Um, Next to the bathhouse is another rather peculiar and very badly ruined building, which I suspect may actually have been a, a hotel, I mean an, an inn, quite different from the Mancio, one that could have been used by um, freelance travellers um, in the normal way. Um, uh, so it's, and then above the site, there's the fortress, uh, right on the, the hilltop, magnificent views to the north and south, just a tiny uh, 35 by 25 meters um, a lookout point rather than a defensive fortress. Um, uh, so the, the upper site is, is interesting in itself and I left it out of the discussion because I, I wanted to keep the focus on uh, this question about transhumans and uh, the upper site doesn't give me so many answers to that question as the lower site. Evet, bir soru. Dördüncü yüzyılın mansiyosunun bulunduğu yerde daha erken bir mansiyo var mıydı? Mark Wilson sormuş. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. There's no evidence for it. Uh, there's no sign of an earlier building. Uh, the fourth century is only a guess as to the date of the building I showed you. The reason for that is that it's, it's, it's quite well built. It's better than some of better quality of construction than some of the other uh, rubble and mortar buildings there. And almost all the evidence we have about mansiones in the Roman Empire from written sources, from inscriptions, from legal sources dates to the fourth century. This was the great era of these mansiones, they, they, they become very important and, and they're very much in, in, in the, the eye. So I'm, I'm, I, I can't prove it, but I, I would be surprised if the mancio is later than the fourth century. It could be a little earlier. I mean, it would not be a shock if it were dated to 250 
uh, not to 350 AD, uh, but I would be surprised if it were um, 450 AD, and I would be surprised if it were, two, uh, were, were before 200. So I will stick with somewhere around 300 to 350 as the most likely date for it, and there is no sign of an earlier one. Teşekkür ederim. Günder Hanım, Günder Varinlioğlu bir soru sormuş. Haritada e, kabilelerin olduğu yerler işaretliydi. Hangi kanıtlar ya da deliller e, size orada kabilelerin olduğunu gösteriyordu? Böyle bir soru, evet. Thank you, Günder. Greetings. Um, uh, the the, the evidence for my three flags are simply the findings of inscriptions which mention the occupying groups or populations living there, not by place names of cities, but by the, the names of uh, tribal groups. I think there are the Ormelais, uh, the Alasais, and the Miliadais, or possibly others. But, um, so it's it's it's not a very um, substantial uh, basis for, for for my claim, and uh, we just got almost random epigraphic or literary evidence about uh, uh, tribal areas, and we have to be careful about what that word tribal area actually means, uh, because those communities were certainly organised communities, it's not as if they were um, uh, sort of simply uncontrolled, uh, you know, they, they, they, they had their own hierarchies and, and organization. They will also have had their settlements. I'm more impressed than in, on my, my own map um, by the fact, by the, the sheer absence of fixed settlements across so much of this area, that there are just very few, despite the fact that people have been studying and traveling in these parts of Asia Minor for, you know, 200 years now in, in the sort of tradition of uh, uh, exploration and epigraphic scholarship and topographic scholarship. And actually there are very few settlements, uh, fixed settlements across the, the region. And um, uh, this may be wrong. I mean, it may be that a really careful detailed archeological survey would show that this pattern is, is that the real pattern is, is quite different. Um, but the, the sheer absence of, of ancient towns and ancient cities uh, is, is, is very striking to my mind. Um, as for the, the, the, word, the word tribal, as I said, the tribal opens up a, an expanse of questions that I probably can't begin to answer now. Teşekkür ederiz. Biraz daha kısa olursa e, soru cevap çok e, yetiştirmemiz lazım dört buçuğa kadar. E, bir soru Beri Vos'tan. Sarı Hacılar, Sarı Hacılar oradaki eski yol Via Sebastian'in bir parçası mı? Um, thank you for the question. I can't, I can't remember where Sarı Hacılar is exactly. Can you remind me or tell me for the first time? O zaman chatten yazdıktan sonra cevap verelim vakit kaybı evet, olmaması için. Evet, evet. Chatten, uh, chatten evet. e-mail ile uh, cevap vereceğim. Um, I can answer by email, but I need a little more information before I can answer that question. I think the answer is no, but I'm... Tamam. E, şimdi döşeme boğazı, üst döşeme boğazını cevapladık. Bir soru Levent Kozanoğlu. E, Hierapolis ve Leodik Kenya'daki antik tekstil ekonomisi bugünkü denizlerin tekstile dayalı ekonomisi bir tesadüf müdür? Geçmişten gelen bir e, süreklilik mi var? Uh, Oğuz, can you translate to me the second part of that? Uh, bir tesadüf müdür? Uh, yani, Hierapolis ve Laodikeya antik tekstil ekonomisi ile günümüzdeki 
Denizli'nin tekstil ekonomisi arasında bir bağ var mı, bir ilişki var mı? Um, the well, we we we have a lot of information about the ancient textile industry in Hierapolis and Laodicea um, from the ancient sources, um, and probably the most important source is the price edict of the Emperor Diocletian, which lists a number of textile products from uh, these cities with their prices indicating whether they were luxury goods or ordinary goods and different prices. Um, and that can be combined with, with, with a lot of other local evidence, uh, which um, shows the, the importance of the textile industries for these two cities in antiquity. Um, including, of course, the fact that the water produced at the the the, um, yeah, the lime rich really. water of, of, of Hierapolis was particularly important for dyeing um, procedures. Is that a, a good enough answer? Evet evet benim için ben anlaşılan bir cevaptı. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Bir soru beri bostan. Aziz Pol via Sebaste'den Yalvaç'a olan o yolu kullandı mı? Ee, evet, Aziz Pol. Yeah, I, I'm, I think so, certainly. Mm -hmm. evet. um, there are many theories about which route Pol might have taken from the south coast to Yalvaç, and nobody will be ever be able to prove uh, exactly which one is right. But I, my, I imagine that. Paul was a Roman citizen. He was he was traveling. He took the boat from Cyprus, where he'd actually been a guest of the Roman governor. And the Roman governor in Cyprus, his family came from I see in Antioch, from from Yalvaç. So I think Paul had a recommendation, and the governor would have said, "I can give you introductions to my." to my family, to my people in, in, in, in Yalvaç, if you, you're looking to go to Anatolia. Uh, and it's a very important city. It's a very important Roman city. And Paul doesn't go to obscure places. He goes to important cities to take his message. And I think he would have taken the main road. And the main road was the Via Sebastian. Bir soru çok az vaktimiz kaldı için maalesef hızlı ilerliyorum. Remzi Yağcı'dan geldi. E, yollar ile e, gömülerin e, yoğunluğu arasında bir e, ilişki var mıdır? Yani herhalde mezar yapılarının demek istiyor. Burials. Um, yes, there's... Um... Uh, I, I, in an early version of this lecture, which would have taken too long, I talked about the burials. There are lots of um, Roman period burials connected both to the lower and to the upper site, including small heroa um, uh, sarcophagi uh, placed on, on, on, on podia, um, cyst graves, uh, some of the sarcophagi have inscriptions, not very many. Uh, some of them are decorated. There's a famous one, which I have never seen because it seems to have disappeared, but I may just have overlooked it with a lion over, on roof of, on top of the, um, the, the sarcophagus, which was seen by all the travelers in the lower site. Um, all the graves that we can see date to the second to third centuries AD, as with so many cemeteries in uh, southwest Anatolia. Um, they were all placed, as far as I can see, so that they were very visible from the road, so that the passers-by would be aware of these graves and they would send a message, you know, for, for eternity about the families who were buried there. Um, they uh, one question which I cannot answer, and I very much know, like to know whether anybody can, is why is it that when we have a site like the Dershime Boise, which both of the lower and the upper sites were probably occupied from the Roman Empire period, say the second century AD to the sixth century, seventh century AD, 
but we only have burials that are identifiable and datable that belong to sort of second and third centuries AD, either because they have inscriptions or because of the style of the burial. Where were people buried later in the fourth, fifth and sixth centuries um, when we just don't see any trace of later burials uh, on most of these sites? Uh, the later burials were either very inconspicuous or, and this is my theory, is that families continued to use the same tomb over and over again, um, even though some of the inscriptions say, oh, don't put another burial here, there's gonna be a fine if you do. Um, I think that, that they became family burial places and, um, uh, and, and were reused. And one of the arguments I'd use to support that is that the tombs are often in very good condition, but the sarcophagi, they're not, of course they've been robbed, but um, the sarcophagus is still standing there on the podium where it was originally placed uh, after 2000 years. Somebody looked after that tomb for a very long time uh, before it finally ran into neglect. But yes, there is definitely a connection uh, to make it very simple between the roads and the density of the burials. Son soruyu o zaman e, sormak istiyorum çünkü son bir dakikamız Beate e, Hanım sormuş, Beate Böhlendorf Aslan diyor ki e, 4. yüzyıldaki mansiyonun bulunduğu yerde daha sonraki 5. ve 6. yüzyıllara tarihlenen e, kiliseler var. Hı -hı. Acaba bir tamirat olmuş bu bu mansiyoda? Altıncı yüzyılda ve daha sonra. Um, thank you for the question. No, I think the answer is I could see no trace of any significant rebuilding or restoration or extension of the Mancio at a later period. It, it looks as if this is a, a. It was built at one time. It must have been maintained in good condition for maybe some decades or even hundreds of years, but it, it wasn't rebuilt in the later fifth or, or sixth centuries. Um, although uh, the, the question is, is quite right. I, I, I, I, I, I, no, there, there was no sign of repair or um, use. I mean, I think the Mancio could have been used until the sixth century, uh, but I can't, prove that by pointing to bits of the building which were clearly repaired after the fourth century. It seems to have been maintained, but it doesn't seem to have been repaired or uh, rebuilt in a significant way. And at the end, at some period at the end, I think it uh, collapsed or fell into disuse after an earthquake because there's uh, major damage to the walls on the uh, southwest side, uh, which look as if they're the result of cracks and, and, and collapse caused by earthquake. Çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ee, Sayın e, Michel, böylece e, e, konferansımızın sonuna geldik. E, Profesör e, Michel'a çok çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Ee, bize e, bu olanağı verdiği için, kendisini dinleme olanağı verdiği için e, ve e, çevirmenimiz Karel Hanım'a da e, aynı şekilde e, çok teşekkür ediyorum. E, Steven Bey son bir şey söylemek ister misiniz bilmiyorum. Artık ben e, izleyicilerimize de veda etmek zorundayım. Um, thank you very much for the, first of all, for, for, for, for, for... Uh, organizing the, the, the event and, and for uh, in posing the questions and, and organizing the questions so well, which are um, uh, a great set of questions which I'm looking at in the chat. I hope I can recover those afterwards. Um, anybody who wants to um, follow up uh, any, any detail, please um, send me an email and I'll try and uh, um, answer, answer it uh, at least briefly. Um, I'm sure Owes Bay, if, 
can give you my email if, if, if, I, if you don't know it already or don't have access to it already. Um, uh, it's a great privilege to be able to talk about the, the, these things which have fascinated me recently. Um, I hope that some of the questions that you've asked will be answered in the publication, which uh, we hope will appear in the course of the, the coming few months. Um, uh, but there are several questions which are opening up uh, ideas which uh, need to be taken further, but that's the nature of research. Um, and uh, so uh, to which we can all contribute. Thank you so much. All right. Uh... Biz e, çok teşekkür ediyoruz kendisine tekrar. Ekay Hanım size de çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Gerçekten çok güzel bir konferanstı. Her, her şey de çok anlaşılırdı. E, değerli izleyiciler, e, böylece etkinliğimizin de e, sonuna gelmiş bulunuyoruz. E, bugün pazar demiştim. Saatimiz dört buçuk, birazcık da birkaç dakika geçti hatta. E, bundan sonraki e, zaman dilimi içinde pazar günü e, güzel vakit geçirmenizi e, diliyorum. Hoşçakalın. Hepinize hoşçakalınız. Görüşürüz inşallah. Hoşçakalın. İyi günler diyorum. Sağ olun.